Doctors at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine made a big sleep apnea breakthrough, got 52,000 views on this and counting. It's still going up. That's why I wanted to make this deeper dive into this subject because these two guys here uh, were looking at a hormone that already does a lot of things in the body and they asked themselves, how does this relate to nighttime breathing? And in fact, they found that it's able to have a big impact without starving yourself and without exercise here. So it's something really good. And in one commenter in particular over on TikTok, uh, they're guessing this item helps here. We will talk about that, what that is, and how to do it. So we're going to cover the original research and how this can be done with a few simple shifts. I'm Dylan Pekas. I wish these are things I knew when I overcame my own sleep apnea way back in medical school, went from moderate to no sleep apnea. And this has been something that has been reproduced. Many, many people, including people from severe down to no sleep apnea and sleep studies. You can pause and look at that. Most importantly, everything we cover here for educational purposes only always discuss any new things you're doing with your health with your doctor. So it all starts with Dr. Slava Berger from Johns Hopkins University, and he was bringing these connections together because we know that with sleep apnea, about 60%, 70% of people are overweight with that. Okay, there's that connection. Now, of course, you can have issues without being overweight. We'll talk about that next. But there's also a connection between overweight and leptin. So that's what set the research in motion of like, hey, how is leptin, the concentrations, the resistance, how does that factor into sleep physiology? Now, again, even if you're not overweight, you can have high leptin in any of these scenarios, chronic stress, right? Like you have a high stress job, high stress life, poor sleep, which is probably you <laughs> if you are watching this video. Uh, if you have a bad circadian rhythm, like you're scheduled all over the place when you're eating, when you're going to bed, different times, that's going to hurt leptin. And if you have other conditions that cause a lot of inflammation in your body, whether it's like a gut condition, an autoimmune condition, uh, cancer, that will also lead to leptin resistance. And some earlier research laid the foundation for this. So leptin being directly tied to breathing, not just extra weight and that making breathing difficult, but leptin itself, because it will control how your muscles and your airway, how they keep things open. It will control how you're breathing as well, your diaphragm muscles and all that. It will also regulate how your brain tells your body to breathe because that is an issue not only in central, obviously, but it's also a huge issue in obstructive. A lot of people do not know that. How your brain tells your body to breathe, also a big issue with obstructive sleep apnea because if your brain tells your body to breathe too quickly at times at night, this will actually suction your airway shut at night. Not fun. That's actually how most apnea events happen. So based on how things have been going in the research, that's when these fellas asked themselves the following questions. They probably didn't. So the first author had the, the burning question of what if I got a bunch of mice off the streets of Baltimore, fattened them up to give them breathing problems at night, and then shot leptin into them. That's probably the most crude way you could frame this study. Uh, he definitely had a lot more their thoughts, but just trying to keep things uh, mildly entertaining. That's really my only goal in these episodes. And then second author here uh, was like, yeah, let's go ahead and do this. He probably didn't say that. <laughs> or maybe he did. Now, before we get into this research, yes, this is mechanistic studies in mice. You're not a mice, probably not, right? Uh, but we need to be very clear on the role of mice in men in research here. So animal research, it helps us know, is the mechanism, does it exist at all? All right, yes, a mouse is not a human, a rodent's not a human, a pig's not a human, but there's many similarities in the biochemical physiological pathways. And in fact, all leptin research started in mice and has been translated into humans time and time again. So it's just a starting point as we'll start our discussion here. And then we wanna look at human research. Does the same thing apply in humans more directly? All right, so you can put your little mouse emojis in the comments below. So. Uh, he got his mice here. So this is the study. You can look it up. Uh, and they fed him mouse snacks. And then they gave them uh, leptin in different forms. We're going to cover when they gave leptin intranasally. So this is probably the easiest to interpret graph out of the entire study. Here you can go look deeper, but I want to keep things relatively simple. And I want to address your attention here, all right, this SpO2 line. As you can see, you may not need a magnifying glass for this. Leptin, this is higher. When they didn't get leptin, it is lower, all right? And you'll also notice that in leptin, they were able to have more air going in and out. 
And then another big thing you'll notice is over here. So the EMG, this measures muscle activity. In leptin, it's actually a lot more of a quiet signal. That's because there's probably less labor in their breathing. So to summarize all this, based on this, figure one, when they have a leptin and it's working in their body, they are able to breathe more easily, get more air, get more oxygen. Boom, boom, boom. That's very important. And just to summarize the kind of the main conclusions, uh, leptin decreased the number of oxygen drops at night. So those are things you're experiencing uh, with sleep apnea and increased ventilation during different phases of sleep. Okay. So bottom line, improved leptin function equal improved nighttime breathing. But here's the thing, right? It's not just about raising leptin. Because how this translates into humans is not just simply raise leptin, it is about overcoming leptin resistance. Very, very important. Do not miss this point. I'm going to wave my hands and kind of annoy you here so you look at this, all right? <laughs> because you may ask in the comments, my leptin's higher or low. Look, it's not about the absolute level of leptin. It's about leptin resistance, how leptin can work in your body. All right, so keep that in mind. Another thing to keep in mind and check out is the personalized breathing blueprint. Custom set of exercises to help you breathe based on where you're at with your breathing. Have a nice personalized path so it's easy. You know what to do every single day and have massive progress towards better sleep. Link in the description or go to apneareset.com forward slash show. And back to our regular scheduled programming. So leptin resistance and how to fix this. So as we've said before, leptin will impact all these different aspects, the breathing, right? And in humans, this is, this is the thing. The higher leptin is, the more severe sleep apnea is. There's a very tight correlation between these two. It is found in this study. And then this study, which is a meta-analysis of 45 other studies, found the same thing. So it's a very, very tight relationship. All right. Which came first, leptin leading to the sleep apnea, vice versa. Doesn't really matter because we're going to talk about how to address both problems here. Um, but then there's this point of confusion I was talking about, right? I want to be very clear on this. Humans, high leptin equals worse breathing. Mice, we raise their leptin levels, they have better breathing. This doesn't make sense. All right, Jackie Chan is confused. Maybe you're confused. I was confused long, long ago thinking about leptin. It's good we have our mutual confusion. And we're going to on confuse ourselves here for a moment here to understand kind of more of the nitty gritty physiology of what's going on. So let's say those mice before they had their mouse Thanksgiving, their leptin receptors were like this. And just to let's back up, let's even back up further. Every hormone has a receptor and then the hormone goes into that receptor. And when this happens, that's when the effect of the hormone takes place inside of a cell. The leptin needs to dock into the leptin receptor and then everything does its thing. That is normal physiology. Leptin resistance is when these receptors go away, they stop working for whatever rhyme or reason. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of rhymes and reasons we'll talk about in a moment, but they just stop working. And then as a response, because now there's fewer receptors working, your body will make more and more leptin to try to get leptin molecules to interact with few receptors. So in the study where they put leptin in the nose of these mice, they overcame fewer leptin receptors by flooding the mice with really high amounts of leptin. Now, it's not a sustainable solution because if leptin goes way up, the body will continue to lower the receptors. So it becomes this like nuclear arms race. At a physiological level, that's how leptin resistance works. Now, if you're still confused, that's absolutely fine. This isn't the most intuitive thing to understand. But another way you can think about it is leptin is the text message, right? Leptin resistance is your text message is not received. So what do you do? You just try to keep sending more of them, <laughs> All right? So it can go high. Um, that's another way to think about the signal not being received by the body. That's why a lot of times we'll say leptin function uh, as opposed to just leptin high, leptin low. All right. Bigger question from Bob, Bob the Builder, is can we fix it? 
So, I mean, you could just end the video and say no and <laughs> watch for more, subscribe and like. Well, let's actually be useful here. So, if one way destroy is left in function, so in order to return to a good state, we need to reset the receptors and also the amount of leptin we have floating around, right? So, we need to allow the receptors to work more properly and we need to lower the background levels of leptin so the receptors they're out there and they're not getting like bombarded all the time by leptin so it's just reversing that okay uh and as a result leptin will normalize right think of it like insulin in a way in diabetes insulin is high all the time it doesn't work as well but when we normalize things in a diabetic state insulin goes back to a normal healthy range so for all of this, this is why a lot of things that reset leptin, right? Like whether it is a uh, high intensity interval training, whether it is uh, lowering inflammation in your diet, all these things can work short term and they will have a positive impact on sleep before there's any weight loss whatsoever because of focusing in on this core mechanism. And by fixing this core mechanism, weight loss also becomes easier. So in terms of resetting leptin, so a few major things. One, that, that TikTok comment before, about this here. Now, I am not pro prescription for any chronic things just because that's how I roll, right? But your health, your body, your choice, whatever you want to do here, and pronouncing some of these drug names makes me feel like Brad Pitt with poor levels of Italian. Like I said, third best Italian. <sighs> Carry on here. So, with this GLP 1 agonist that does not directly impact leptin, but will improve leptin sensitivity because of the actions it will have on weight loss, right? It'll force weight loss biochemically. Uh, and then as a result, leptin will eventually normalize. That is one way to skin the cat and my cat's in the room. So sorry. Um, but we have other ways that you can directly impact leptin. Uh, so if you don't want to do that, that's another option. But of course, none of these are real options. These are all options to talk about your doctor too. Don't do anything you learn from YouTube without speaking to them. So with leptin, it's very important to note that it is a circadian hormone. That means it'll look something like this throughout the day. It goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, etc, etc. So in resetting it, we need to really work on the circadian rhythmicity of it all, right? So as part of that, and there's going to be I think I got four things here. Number one, protein first. So having about 30, 60 grams of protein at breakfast. And again, there's gonna be a lot of different ways to get that in. That will help sort of reset leptin for the day ahead and also help with hunger levels and all of that uh, to really sort of allow things to work. It'll also really increase GLP-1, little natural thing there. But in doing so, uh, that could be a hefty chunk of protein for people. I mean, usually the easiest thing is just like just having a scoop of protein powder in addition to what you're already doing. The smallest changes are usually the things you want to go for the most with the biggest impacts. So that is number one. Number two is stop eating within three hours of bed. That is a spelling grammatical error for the generation there. Anyway, so when you eat too close to bed, this will spike insulin. And whenever insulin is high, that will blunt leptin. Leptin will not work. So that's again why in diabetes, obesity, if you have insulin being really high, that will also reduce leptin function. So if you're eating too close to bed, leptin cannot do its thing at night, which we need to because leptin naturally should go higher at night to allow a lot of great things to happen, like properly regulating your sleep and your breathing. But if it's blocked by insulin, that is not going to happen as well. Don't eat so close to bedtime. Number three, I feel like I'm out of order circadian rhythm wise. Yeah, I got a little out of order. Got out of my rhythm, I guess. Number three is high intensity interval training two or three times a week. So this isn't so circadian minded, uh, but how it works, it stimulates a different pathway, AMP kinase, AMPK, and that will regulate leptin and so on and so forth here. So, I mean, kind of boring. Now back to the circadian aspect. So every time you can have a strong circadian signal, that sets your rhythm, that will then help leptin dramatically. One of them being is getting light in the morning here, all right? Especially the closer to when you wake up is going to be better. So 
Uh, maybe if you heard my my dog bark, we have some people doing some uh, fun stuff on the on the vents today. Um, really thrilling. She'll bark in the morning. That's usually my signal to get up because roosters, my neighbor's roosters, are so are not enough. But that allows me to consistently wake up. She has a good rhythm because then usually within 10, 20 minutes, the sun is rising and that sunlight hitting my eyes is going to tell my body it's a certain time. And that's going to help set hormones because the cascade of all these hormones is going to come from your body's hypothalamus that's in your brain. And your hypothalamus is connected, you know, through your eye to the external stimuli in your environment. So if you're getting morning light and you're not just like, you know, on your cell phone first thing in the morning, unless you're checking my all my posts and liking them. Uh, no, that's still bad. Don't do that before the sun is up. Getting about like three, five minutes unfiltered, right? No sunglasses. Don't stare at the sun. Feel silly having to tell you that. Uh, but just having an ambient light coming in will help set your rhythm, help with leptin, and everything will work a lot better from there. Now, one of the biggest things that will help with leptin, as we said, a circadian aspect to it is having good sleep, right? We said that's one of the reasons you can have leptin resistance by itself was just bad sleep can lead to leptin resistance. And that's why bad sleep will also lead to weight gain because of the leptin as that mean mediator and being able to sleep better. Oftentimes, if you're here, you, you need to be able to breathe better, right? And a big part of that, I mean, in addition to everything I've ever talked about ever, the fastest path is our personalized breathing blueprint. Pretty much, you just have a custom plan set out for you. So day by day, you know exactly what you're doing. And it's done in a way where it's matched to you and your needs. So you know or you're actually on a very good progress path to make the most amount of progress in your breathing in the least amount of time and have that reflected in better sleep. And of course, get some other fun things, you know, direct support for me, any questions you have and holistic protocols there. Uh, if you want that, apneureset.com forward slash show. And if I'm really smart, I'll have a button in the middle here. You can go ahead and click that to check it out. Either way, I'm Dylan Pecos. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you on the next page.